Well, I certainly hope there's not been anything you may be seated to steal your joy this week, but if it did, I hope you find it again, all right? Because uh, Jesus is the one who gives us joy, and he says it's joy that's so good, so profound, it's unspeakable. You can't find words to explain it. So thank you for being here. It is our privilege to have you at New Hope. Thank you for being here on a holiday weekend. Otherwise, I wouldn't have had to have worked today, all right? But I'm glad that you are here. Thank you for coming. If you are a guest today, you honor us by your presence. There are some communication cards in the pew in front of you. I would love for you to fill it out, put it in the offering bag. We make a couple of promises here. One, we will not come pound on your door. Number two, we will not bug you on the telephone. All we're going to do is uh, send you some information through the mail that will tell you about our church, what we believe, who our staff is, what ministries we have, what times our services are, and hopefully uh, engage you in some of those if you would like to be. So thank you for filling that out. You won't be the only ones filling one out. Members in our church, regular attenders do. They give us uh, prayer requests, praise items. Uh, Like last week, we baptized 18 in our two morning services. It was terrific Sunday. Absolutely great. So when folks are prepared to be baptized, they indicate that. uh, Something you want information about, you can do that. So you won't be the only one filling out a card, but we would love for you to take care of that. I want to draw your attention towards the screen, and we're going to look at our morning announcements. But just before we do, the first announcement is wrong. Just thought I'd clarify that. There will not be a men's breakfast this Saturday, and it's going to tell you there is. But you'll find out why there's not one in just a little while. Let's watch. Men's breakfast is coming up the second Saturday of the month. Starts at 8 o'clock, coffee's on at 7.30, so come along and enjoy some good food and fellowship. September 9th is going to be a very special day for us at New Hope. Over the last 10 years, we have been engaged in ministry in the Ivory Coast, Côte d'Ivoire of Africa. Uh, We have taken a team in every year for the last 10 years to share with 1040i and Mike Cousineau. They are going to be with us on September the 9th for all three of our Sunday morning services and our Sunday evening service. If you want to know more about what's going to take place this next February, I hope you'll come and join us that Sunday. Our ministry with 1040i is a wonderful experience. We get to engage in medical outreach, evangelistic outreach, and construction projects. So if you have an interest in having an overseas experience in mission work, show up September the 9th, hear about this trip, And maybe this will be just for you. We have a Thursday morning men's Bible study. It meets at 6 a.m. and it concludes at 645. So if you're retired, you get up early, you can go home and take a nap. If you are part of the working group, uh, we get you out of here in time to to get to the job. But we're going to be kicking off a brand new study the Thursday after Labor Day. So if you are looking for a place to connect, if you're looking to get better acquainted with other men, if you're looking to do a deeper Bible study, we would love to have you check out Thursday morning, early morning Bible study, 6 to 645 every single Thursday. Man, it's that time of year again. It's time for man camp. October 19th through the 21st, either in a tent, an RV, or a trailer, come along and just do some camping, fishing, hiking, or if you just want to set up a hammock and sleep, then that's what this is for. Saturday night, we'll have the wilderness service where we'll do worship and there'll be a message. But other than that, the time is your own. So come and join us this year. Sign up to online. So go to our webpage and sign up now. Family nights are starting again. Wednesday, September the 12th, there'll be adult and kids Bible studies. The kids this session are going to spend seven weeks learning about the life of Jacob through various slime experiences. We're going to make lots of slime. That's for our preschool through fourth grade students. And of course, our fifth and sixth graders are still meeting every week as well. If you're a parent and you're dropping off a kid for the kids studies, or you're just an adult that wants to go to a Wednesday night adult Bible study, then I'll be doing Forgotten God by Francis Chan. It's a chance to talk about the Holy Spirit and find out how we can re-engage with the Holy Spirit in our lives. And that goes from 7 to 8, the same time as the kids' sessions. We also have dinner at 6.15 for anyone that wants to come that's going to these Bible studies. If you're interested in doing Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University, the nine-week class starts on September the 16th. It's at 3 o'clock on Sunday afternoons, and there's a sign-up sheet going around today. To get more information on these and other upcoming events, visit newhopechurch.net. 
right. Let me get uh, the sign-up sheets going around. There's three on uh, each clipboard. They're the same, so one down each side. Uh, what you'll find on here, first of all, is Senior Luncheon. Is what? what uh, yeah, you can go ahead and get st- Senior Luncheon. Uh, senior Luncheon this time around is on September the 11th. So because of 911, we're going to do a little stroll down memory lane and and uh, reflect and pray, uh, and also doing something on a little more happy note as well at, at that luncheon. But you don't have to bring any food. Usually it's potluck. You don't have to bring anything this time except a $5 bill. And if you can't afford the $5, don't worry about it because nobody's going to collect it from you. You'll just drop it in the basket as you get in line. All the food is being made for you this time. You're going to get to enjoy Luna's uh, chef, uh, and Mr. Burt's going to cook it for us. So if you're going to be attending the senior luncheon, please sign up, and that's primarily so we know how many to prepare for. Uh, The second sign-up sheet on here is for men's man camp. We're finding out that men don't go online real well and sign up for things. So... (laughs) Sign up here, and then Mark will sign you up online, okay? Uh, And then uh, the last one is Financial Peace. That's going to be starting September the 16th, 3 o'clock on a Sunday afternoon. It's a great nine-week Bible study on on really what is your money and possessions all about. And uh, it's done by Dave Ramsey, and it's being facilitated here in our church by the Sloans. They have uh, facilitated this class at least four or five times, and so they do a great job at it. So we're going to send these clipboards around, all right? Thank you so much for doing that. We have about 35 to 40 from our church who were up at Hume Lake this weekend. We have 15, I believe. Is that correct, Bill and Lindsay? About 15 of our college students are up there? 10. All right. Well, you know, preachers, we always lie about attendance. Uh, So 10 college students are up at Hume Lake for college camp, but we have about 17 of our high school students and their leaders up there working to serve the college kids. Can you imagine how our 10 college kids are taking advantage of that right now? All right, they're saying, get me this, get me this. What, what happens is, is Hume, the way they do a lot of their weekend camps during the uh, fall and winter and spring, is they ask high school groups to bring their kids up and work. They serve the food, they clean the dishes, and then they get credit towards their camp in the summertime, which usually runs around 500 bucks. So they're able to knock off quite a bit by volunteering. So it just so happened on this weekend, we got high school kids going up to work and college kids going up to be served. And uh, so that's great. So be praying for them. They'll be coming home tomorrow afternoon. Next Sunday, Mike Cousineau and his wife, Deleen, will be with us from 1040i. We'll be talking about our next trip to the Ivory Coast of Africa in February. And that will be your chance if you want to go on a mission trip with me, because this one might be my last one. This will be number seven, all right? And uh, if you want to go, you will need to make that decision next weekend. So we always look forward to that. Uh, Cecil is here in the surf. Cecil Spurlock, stand up for a moment. want people to put face and name together, all right? Cecil's been part of our church for a long time. His wife Kay is sitting right there next to him. Uh, I know that many of you were a little sad last Sunday when Pastor Steve Brown and his wife Laura Lee, we said goodbye to them as they uh, have sort of semi-retired. They sold their home here, bought a home in Cambria. Can you imagine that, leaving Fresno for Cambria? Um, <laughs> They left a 2,400-square-foot house for a 900-square-foot home. The only thing I cared about was that it had two bedrooms. It does. Uh, and so they, uh, their house closed escrow Wednesday afternoon. They were packed and ready to go and took off Thursday morning. They were promised that the house over there would close at noon on Thursday. That was a trip of faith. They were hoping when they arrived they would get keys for their new location. They did, and uh, they are in, and so we're grateful for that. And some of you wonder, well, who is going to help the staff out in the areas that Steve did, and hospital visitation, and senior visits? And uh, your answer to that question is Cecil Spurlock, all right, is going to be filling in that spot for us, and we're very, very excited. We introduced that in our 8 o'clock service, and he stood up right away and said, if you have names of anybody you would like me to go see, get them to me, and he'll follow up. He's really not on the payroll yet, all right? He hasn't signed the paperwork yet this week, all right? But he will get that done, and then uh, he'll be on the job, and we're so excited. Uh, uh, I remember Cecil about as far back as my memory goes, all right? And when he was in Bible college, he and his family were in Dad's church in Fresno, and so we're so grateful to have him on staff with us here. 
uh, the Thursday morning men's Bible study at 6 o'clock. We're starting the Gospel of John, verse-by-verse study uh, from 6 to 6.45 on Thursdays. Um, how many of you have the church's mobile app on your phone? We had, you know, okay, so all right, good, good job. There's about, about a third of you in here do. Uh, put it in the trash and dump it. Okay, you don't need the mobile app anymore. The reason for mobile apps is because you usually can't load the website on, all right? We've had our website redone, retooled, and it no longer needs an app in order to run it. It will work automatically on your cell phone. So you could just put that in your favorites, click on it, it will pop up. If you have been used to the way things were on the old one, I'm sorry. You will need to take a few minutes and figure out the new one. It's not complicated. When you bring it up, go to resources. That's where most of the things will be found that you all look for. It's where you can find the previous week's sermon. It's where you can find the bulletin. It's where you can go to the church directory and all of that. Click on resources. It will give you all those various options. Click on it and you are there. If you have any problems with that, call the office. They will help you get through it, okay? Uh, I just want to give special greeting. I don't do this often, but we have a family sitting, a lady sitting right here that has known me all of my life, all right? And she's not quite as old as dad, and she certainly doesn't look it, all right? But she's almost there. Uh, her daughter, Donna, uh, this is Mrs. Van Horn. Uh, you still from Salinas area? Are you still from Salinas? Yes. Okay, from the Salinas area. Her uh, daughter Donna was uh, dad's worship leader for several years at the church in Fresno when he was pastoring and just been longtime friends. And it's so good to have them, uh, have them in our service today. Donna was supposed to be here and I was going to surprise her and have her sing a solo today. And she got sick during the night, all right, and is not able to be here. But it's great to have all of you here from Donna's family. Uh, a few prayer requests I want to give you updates on. Reba Chamberlain, our 93-year-old from the 8 o'clock service, fell, broke her femur. She had to have a plate and screws in it. And I know what most of you think when somebody in their mid-80s to early 90s falls and breaks a hip or a femur. What normally happens? It's usually the open door for going to heaven. You guys don't know Reba. Reba is so annoyed that the physical therapy facility doesn't come four or five times a day, that they only come twice a day. And so she is in her bed doing her leg lifts and her exercises. And uh, every time I show up, she has a written down list of what it is that uh, I can help take care of for her. Reba has no family. She has outlived all of her siblings, uh, outlived her husband. She did not have any children, and we are her church family. I mean, the church family is her family. And so, uh, but Reba is determined she's going to be home taking care of things again very, very soon. And she has an appointment Wednesday with the orthopedic surgeon to give us an update of when that might be that she will go home. We had three memorial services here this past week. I want you to remember those families, our own John Miller. Uh, this place was packed with every chair that we could get in here and 45 to 50 were in our overflow room for his service. I've never seen so many real estate agents in one place and they didn't try to sell anybody a thing, all right? Uh, but it was a, a great day celebrating his life. And then we had the service for Julia Checkets and uh, Judith's mom, Judith is sitting right here. And uh, I found out something about a member of our church, this <laughs> handsome sort of halfway ball headed guy sitting right here. <laughs> he plays the guitar and he sings. I did not know that. I did not know that. You will be seeing him one of these days on the stage. Trust me, all right? And um, anyway, just do, do be praying for Julia's family. I know they would appreciate that so much. And then we had a service for Donna Scow, long-time um, long resident here in the area. She worked for Channel 30 uh, for several years. That's actually where she found, met, and ended up marrying her husband. Guess who showed up to the service this week from Channel 30? former weatherman. Angelo, that's right. Angelo was there, met he and his wife, wonderful people, and they said, don't be surprised if we don't see them in church one of these days very, very soon. Then I told them I knew John Longstaff, and they said, oh, we can't go to the same church that John Longstaff goes to. <laughs> Actually, uh, Angelo's wife and John were in church as kids together. All right, and so that's how the connection got made. And then I want you to be praying for the Levendusky family. Uh, Jim, the son is here. 
You know, we've been praying for Mary Ann uh, since February, uh, into January, 1st of February. Her and John Miller were diagnosed with cancer about the same time, two different types. Uh, they both went through their treatments, had some brief moments of, of improvement. And um, last Sunday I shared with you that Mary Ann was in the hospital with her kidneys not working right, and that Monday she was probably going home under hospice care. That's exactly what happened. And Thursday mid-morning, Mary Ann, very peacefully, very quietly, with her family surrounding her, she went to heaven. And her memorial service will be this coming Saturday here at New Hope at 10 o'clock in the morning. Now you know the reason why we are not having men's breakfast next Saturday is so that we have everything ready for that memorial service. Please be praying for uh, the Levendusky family. They are just a terrific family. And uh, God has been so, so good to them during this week, and they have responded so well to God's love and care. And um, I just want to say thank you to Jim. You can pass it on. Thank you for your family allowing me to be such a part of this journey. I have been blessed and honored by it. Um, I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward, wait on us as we have our morning tithes and offering. Would you join with me as we pray? Father in heaven, it's great to be your child. It's wonderful to know your son, the Lord Jesus. It's comforting, Father, to know that at the beginning of a week, we don't have to worry about the adventure of the week ahead of us. We may have a lot of things scheduled and planned on our day timers and our smartphones, but uh, that doesn't stop from surprises or inconveniences or just things that are downright trouble popping up in our world. But Father, none of those things that may take us by surprise catch you off guard. You know about them, you are prepared for them, and you are ready to be our sufficiency and our strength. And uh, you're, you're, you're ready to provide us the encouragement we need, the comfort uh, that we can't live without. And, and we just want to say thank you, Father, that nothing catches you out of sorts. Father, for those occasions this past week when we ignored you, when we didn't put our faith in you and our dependence upon you, but we tried to get through situations on our own. Thank you for your patience with us and your kindness to work in and through us and to nudge us back to trusting you for whatever it is that we face, the good, the bad, the horrible, the ugly. You want to be there for it all, and you are there for it all. Lord, we uh, trust you with the needs of families in our congregation who have experienced the momentary loss of someone Thank you for the hope that heaven holds out to us that this momentary loss will end in a far, far grander way than we could ever hope or imagine. And Father, however you may want to use any of us to be of help and personal encouragement to families in our church, may you find us ready and willing and available. Lord, we uh, trust you with the needs of others who are, uh, are going for treatment and are engaged in, in follow-up activities from surgery like Reba, like Irma McGuinn, we trust you with their needs as they're in Stanford preparing for uh, some pretty serious treatment at the end of the month. Thank you for your encouragement and strength in them. Lord, for what do you want to say and do to us in this service today? May you find uh, the fact that we have very attentive ears and, more importantly, very receptive and responsive wills to your leadership. We trust you with Donna's needs that can't be with us today, Lord, and trust she recovers very, very quickly. For the privilege of giving and sharing, we say thanks. Thank you for how you provide for your kingdom work in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I, uh, first off, Randy, you're tearing it up over there today, man. It is awesome. Great job. I think he's really excited because his son uh, completed something this past week in the military, and I'm very, I'm very excited about that. And he also sent a video, I understand, of all the cards our seniors wrote to his troop and their chance to read them. So we'll have to see that in the future, but that's exciting. But I got some bad news this morning, um, and I just want us to pray for another church in our state. It's up in Chino. I've, I have no idea who this church is. I've never met the pastor. Um, I hope to see him someday in heaven. Um, we just sang a song that talks about the Lion of Judah, and he'll fight our battles for us. And sometimes, even in ministry, we think the battles are ours to fight. 
And trust me, in ministry, if you don't let the Lord fight your battles, the ministry will overwhelm you. It becomes bigger than what we are. Some people get an idea that pastors are something supernatural, and we're not. We're flesh and blood and bone just like you are. The only thing supernatural about us is the same thing that's supernatural about you. His name is Jesus. And if we don't let him fight our battles, sometimes the battles overwhelm us. His name is Pastor Andrew. And uh, last week, as a result of the hardships and the frustrations and what he thought, I guess, were failures, the expectations overwhelmed him, and he took his own life. And so his church... I'm sure, is not worshiping in the same way that we have this morning. And um, they, need, they need a touch of God's grace at work in their fellowship. And so I want us to pause for a moment this morning, and I want us to pray for the Inland Hills Church in Chino, California, because they are facing some struggles, not just in the first week or two, but over the next several months. And so I just want us to pause and pray for them. Would you join with me, please? Father, we never, never have, and I assume we probably never will, have the answer to all of the why questions in life. Lord, I have been so blessed for 35-plus um, years to have pastored one place, many of the same people, they have been so grace-filled. Uh, this has been a joy. But there are times in life and times in ministry when it gets hard. And sometimes when people's expectations are far bigger than our own abilities, and if we don't remember who we serve and who wants to serve through us, and that is your Son, the Lord Jesus, we can be overwhelmed by the job. And so I pray for a real evidence of your grace in the life of this pastor's wife and his kids. I pray that, as somebody wrote so many years ago, um, don't shoot the wounded. I pray that this congregation will rally around this family, and I pray that other congregations will rally around that church, be there to encourage them and strengthen them. And if there's a need for some correction, by your grace, that all of that will take place. If there's any way you can use us from this far away, may you find us ready, willing, and available to be responsive to your leadership. But Father, may this fellowship be very, very aware of your love, your availability to them in this crisis. May they know that you are the one who will sustain them and lead them through the valley of trouble. Thank you for the privilege of praying for them today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're new with us today, uh, either uh, you're visiting from out of town or it's your first time here to, to, to check us out, we've been engaged in a sermon series since the beginning of the year on the subject of heaven. We're calling it What's Up With Heaven. Um, it's where all of us hope to go someday. And uh, we've been discovering some things about the subject of heaven that I hope have been helpful for us. The, the goal and the purpose of this series uh, has been that as you and I approach the valley of the shadows of trouble, whether it's our own life that faces death or whether we're walking with friends or family members as they go through the valley of the shadows, that, that, that the season of our grief, our frustration, our anger, our questions why, and the hope and love and joy of Jesus Christ will fill a gap in between. And we won't go from questioning, that we will go from questioning to hope very quickly. Instead of there being long seasons of discouragement and despair, that with the Word of God firmly rooted in our hearts and our mind and having a greater understanding about where we're going, that we will see this thing called death and heaven as just another another step in our Christian growth and maturity. Instead, people tend to avoid the subject. We try to ignore it, thinking that by doing that, it's going to postpone it. And trust me, it won't. It's going to come for every single one of us. 
We've discovered in this time that uh, you've got to talk about some other subjects when you talk about heaven, and one of them is death, because as the wisdom of a sixth grade boy in a Sunday school class that we learned the very first week, when the Sunday school teacher asked his class, how do you get to heaven, one little boy said, you've got to die first, and he's absolutely correct. It's usually the way we get there. So we have to talk about death some, and we've done that. When you talk about heaven, you also have to talk about hell just a little bit. There's not only one place to go when you die. We have a choice. There are options. And we spent about three weeks, a few weeks ago, looking at the other place. And uh, we're done with hell. I hope that's true for all of you. Hope you're done with hell. And uh, we're going to be wrapping up in just a couple of weeks looking at some final things about heaven. We've been trying to answer many of your questions. If you recall the first couple of weeks, you all sent me through text, email, and handwritten notes questions you had that you've always wanted to know about what was heaven going to be like, who's going to be there. And we've, we've done our best to answer most of those questions. We have a few more to look at. Um, today's going to be a little bit different than a normal sermon. I'm kind of combining some things I did at 8 o'clock that I don't normally do over here. We call the 8 o'clock service that meets in the other building our no frills service. We sing one hymn, and I preach, and they're out of there, all right? They sit around the table with a cup of coffee, all right? And it frees up some space for other two services, and it's, uh, we have a good time over there. But today, uh, and sometimes we take a few thrills over for them, Randy and Milo, Randy and Tim Kepler, when it's his Sunday to lead worship for us, they'll come over and sing. Uh, but today, I'm going to bring into this service what we did in the 8 o'clock service at the outset of the message because it sort of sets a tone for what we want to talk about today. Um, There's a song that uh, I grew up in church singing. Mrs. Van Horn, you will know this song right off the top of your head when you hear it. In fact, if Donna had been here, I was going to ask her to lead it for us today, all right? But instead, Alan Jackson is going to sing it for us today, all right? And I'm going to ask you to join in if you know the words. It's not in the hymnal, so I can't ask you to pull it up. I can't throw it on the screen because I'm already going to have something on the screen. So uh, how many of you remember an old song called, I Want to Stroll Over Heaven With You? If you remember that song, raise your hand. Ah, yeah, good, 12 of you. Um, So the 12 of us can join along in singing and the parts that we know the words. I'm sure most of you'll remember the chorus to the song. I want to stroll over heaven with you some glad day when all our troubles and heartaches are vanished away. Then we'll enjoy the beauty of all things are new. I want to stroll over heaven with you. That's the chorus. If you remember the words of the two verses, then you can join along and sing it with us. Uh, Alan's got a, and, and his mama have a short little testimony uh, at the beginning of this, and his mama has gone to heaven since they recorded this. She went to heaven, I understand, in January. So let's sit back and join in with Alan Jackson. I want to stroll over heaven with you. You can clap too. I think it's appropriate. I. Um, in the last service as we did that, there became a host of names that started coming through my mind of folks I'm going to enjoy taking that stroll with. I, um, I used to laugh a little bit at my father who got a little bit melancholy at moments like this. And now that I'm what his age was then, when I used to laugh, I'm becoming a little melancholy myself. Not out of sadness, out of great joy. Uh, there comes a point where there are so many that you've already known have made the journey that you say, wow, that is really going to be cool when I get there. This past week, at a service, um, where that ball-headed guy right there (laughs) played and sang a song. It's another Alan Jackson song, and you're going to hear it in just a moment. Um, I've heard it on on radio a time or two, but never paid much attention to it. And uh, it really spoke to me the other day. Alan Jackson wrote this song, at the unexpected death of his sister. She was young, and he had questions about that death, as many of us have questions. We wonder why did, we usually say things like, why did God take them so soon? Why couldn't it have been me? I've heard my dad say numerous times over the last four or five years, I am old and I'm not good for anything much anymore. Why did God take them and not take me? And this is where we need to shorten the gap between our questions 
and our trust and beliefs. Trust and beliefs are designed to shorten those gaps. But if we don't have real confidence in them, then we often stay in the questions and the depression far too long. And so what I love about this song that Alan Jackson wrote for his sister is he doesn't hide the fact that he had questions, but he moves very quickly into the arena of trust. And it reminded me, as I, as I heard that song this week at that memorial service, as I've, as I've visited with Reba and assisted her in her things so much this week, and I see her sense of spirit, her fact she's preparing to live at 93 as if she's got 10 more years to go, but at the same time wanted me to know she's got all of her arrangements made and she's ready and she wants, she, she wants us to know that it won't be a problem. There is that excitement to life and there's that excitement to eternity in her that more of us need to have. And it reminded me of the last serious conversation, and you all have heard me tell it too many times, but the story that my mom gave me the last morning that I really had a chance to visit with her. I knew, I knew God was taking her soon. I was in a suit sitting by her bedside because I had two funerals that day. I did not want to leave the bedroom at Heinz Hospice Home. I just wanted to sit there. And I leaned over and whispered to her, and I said, Mama, I don't want to go today. You're never too old for your mama to still teach you things. And I don't know if it was my tie or my lapel she grabbed, but she pulled me down close, and she said, you go give hope to people who may not have it. We've got more than we need. And I thought, oh, you're right, Mama, but I don't like it. There needs to be that reality in us that we have more hope than we need, and that's what gets us from the questioning phase to the trusting phase much quicker. Listen to the testimony of Alan Jackson as he deals with these issues in the death of his sister. It's called Sissy Song. Do you notice how quickly he goes from questions to don't worry about me? to saying anger shot up to God, and in the next sentence, how much he needed the love of God. That is what understanding in a more, in a deeper way, the subjects of heaven and death and Christ's life for us. We've got to be rooted deep in these things. I invite you to turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 21 and chapter 22. We're going to read a few verses out of each chapter. Revelation is one of the easier books in the Bible to find. It's the very last one. (laughs) If you can't find that one, we got trouble. Um, Now, you will not find the book of Revelations, by the way, just a little side note. There is no book in the Bible called Revelations. We often say it that way, but if you read it, it's singular. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ to John about eternity. There were four chemistry majors at the university who decided to take a road trip prior to their senior finals. Due to their extended partying, they were very late getting back to the campus. And as a result, they overslept the next morning and missed the main chemistry exam of the semester. However, they decided to tell their professor that they'd had a flat tire on their way back to campus to see if he would give them a makeup exam. The professor listened and was very gracious and agreed to give them a makeup test. When the students came to take the exam, they noticed that the professor had put a desk in each corner of the room facing a wall. Their test was on the desk. He sent them to their assigned seats and told them to begin the test anytime they were ready. When they flipped the test over, they were all shocked to discover there was only one question on the text, on the test. Which tire? (laughs) Needless to say, those four young men got into crisis mode right away. Most of us experience crisis mode, especially as we face the subjects of death and dying and eternity. And you see, one of the crises that we face most in everyday life is our curse, the curse of sin and death. 
The Bible says about every one of us since Adam and Eve fell in the garden that we were going to be born dead in our trespasses and sins, that we were going to be born with the curse of sin and death. It started way back in the book of Genesis and it continues for us today. But thanks be to God, it ends in the book of Revelation. It ends in heaven. Let's read the passages. Revelation chapter 21, let's read verses 1 through 5. Here's what John wrote as God revealed to him the future. John said, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth, which is where you and I live right now, it's passed away. There was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death. There will be no more mourning. There will be no more crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Verse 22, John goes on to say, I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it for the glory of God gives it light and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. You see, in the old cities during that period of time, all the cities were fortified with a fence around it. And at sundown, the gates to the city were closed for safety and protection, so marauders couldn't sneak in. Not true in heaven. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Chapter 22, the first, uh, first five verses. Then the angel showed me the river of water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood a tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And The leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any what? Curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and His servants will serve Him, and they will see His face. And his name will be on their foreheads. There'll be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. And the angel said to me, These words are trustworthy and true. Christian singer and songwriter Stephen Curtis Chapman, he and his family experienced a terrible tragedy several years ago when one of their teenagers accidentally backed over their toddler in the driveway of their own home, killed their daughter instantly. Chapman later wrote a song about heaven, dreaming of when he would see his little daughter again. Listen to some of the words and notice how quickly he moves from question to trust. God, I know it is all of this and so much more. But God, you know, this is what my heart is aching for. God, you know, I just can't see beyond the door. But in my mind's eye, I see a place where your glory fills every empty space. All the cancer is gone. Every mouth is fed. There's no one left in an orphan's bed. Every lonely heart finds their one true love, and there's no more goodbye, and there's no more not enough. There's no more enemy, no more. 
Oh God, I know it's so much more than I can dream. It's far beyond anything that I conceive. So God, you know, I'm trusting you until I see heaven in the face of my little girl. Heaven in the face of my little girl. Today we are looking more at the heaven that God has promised for those of us who believe and trust in Him. In recent weeks and months, we've talked about how there'll be no more pain and no more sorrow and no more tears, how God will be with His people and how the church will be in relationship with Jesus, much like a bride is with her groom on a wedding day, how we will live in complete fulfillment with God as His people. We've talked about some things that would not be in heaven. We've talked about the fact there would be no ambulances, no hospital, no Kleenex in heaven. From today's scriptures, we have a few more things to add to the list of what will not be in heaven. First, in verse 22, it tells us there'll be no temple there, no sanctuaries, no churches in heaven. I'm convinced the reason is is because if there were, all the preachers who went there would be fighting over who gets to preach next Sunday. But I really don't think that's the reason. You see, in the Old Testament, the temple, like its predecessor, the tabernacle, was the residence of God's glory on earth. In the New Testament, it became your life and mine. Our bodies became the temple of the living God. But this physical structure called the temple or the tabernacle, it was structured in such a way that it moved progressively from the outside in and it became more holy as you got to the center You see, it started with a Gentile courtyard on the extremities. It's a place where God even allowed people like me, non-Jews, that they could come. Then there was a Jewish women's court, and then there was the Jewish men's court, and then there was a place where they could come and offer their sacrifices, and then in the very center, the smallest place, the Holy of Holies, where the high priest would enter one time a year on Yom Kippur and offer atonement on behalf of the people for the entire year. I don't know if you studied that part of Old Testament enough to remember, but the other priests, they would tie a rope around the ankle of the high priest as he entered in to the Holy of Holies in case while he was in there he saw too much of the glory of God and it killed him. Then they could pull him out of the room underneath the curtain. See, it was so holy They feared for their own life because the Scripture said no man could look upon the face of God and live. The rest of verse 22 tells us why there won't be a temple. It tells us because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb, they are the temple of heaven. God the Father, God the Son will be living amongst us. We'll be able to see Him without any fear of being in His presence because we will continuously be in His presence. Verse 23 tells us something else that won't be present in heaven. There won't be lights. There won't be any flashlights or ceiling lights or floodlights or candle lights. The, 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 the city has no need for lights. I, I got to be honest, my perverted sense of humor this week, as I thought about that, there is no need for city lights in heaven. <laughs> for those of you who live here, that might tell you something. But there'll be no need for anything because nothing sinful will enter into heaven and everything holy and godly will be seen in the light of Jesus Christ. Verse 22, 5 says... They will not need light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for God will give them light. Light suggests clarity and goodness and purity and warmth and growth and safety. Sometimes when I'm not overwhelmed by the California Central Valley heat, I'll let a a, a sunbeam hit me in the face, and I just relish the feeling of being loved by God. Light to me represents the love of God. God is our light, and the Bible says those who are lovers of darkness, their deeds are evil. Life also suggests, light also suggests God's glory. Do you remember when the Old Testament leader Moses wanted to see God on the Mount Sinai? And God said to him, no, because you're a sinful man, if you see me, you will die. But God did allow Moses to catch a glimpse of the backside of God's glory while he passed by as Moses hid on the cleft of the rock. And in Exodus 33, 19, quotes the Lord saying, I will cause my goodness to pass in front of you. I will proclaim my name in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. In other words, Moses, I'll give you mercy and compassion, and I will let you get a glimpse of my glory. 
This is referred to as the Shekinah glory of the Bible. You and I can't handle that, but someday it will be our light all around us in this wonderful place called heaven. Right now we get little glimpses of God's glory as we see his mercy and compassion reflected in our world. And we extend God's glory in this world as we, chose, as we choose to show mercy and compassion on those who hurt us instead of trying to hurt them back. Those are little previews of heaven on earth. Someday they will be the norm as God's glory will be our light. Verse 27 tells us about heaven's purity. Nothing impure will enter it. Nothing shameful or deceitful, but only those whose name is in the book of life. You see, heaven is a perfect place for perfected people once all of our sins have been stripped away. We're all sinners saved by grace who through God's mercy have our names written in the book. He writes our name in his book with indelible ink and his Holy Spirit holds on to us. And just to pause for a brief moment, if you're here today and you've never invited Jesus in your life, while I finish this sermon or while you hear a concluding song in a moment, sitting right where you are, you can pray a prayer that says, Lord Jesus, come into my life. It, it, it's a simple prayer. It's not an easy prayer, but it's a simple prayer. Why it's not easy is because the first thing we have to do is admit that we are sinners. I sound like a preacher out of the 20s when I say things like that. I'm talking the 1920s. That's what's hard for us in this 21st century is to make an acknowledgement that we're not good people. But we were born with this curse. And until we admit that, we never can allow Jesus to bridge the gap. So it's simple. Admit that I am what I am, a sinner. Invite the Lord Jesus to forgive me of my sin and now come live within my life because I believe he is who he said he is and did what he said he would do. You can use your own words. A thief on a cross said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I'm getting what I deserve. You don't deserve this. Not a fancy prayer not one that was written out anywhere that he read, just an honest confession of his own heart. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me. The next image in this passage is the amazing river of the water of life. It's full. It's flowing from the throne of God itself. There'll never be a drought in heaven. There'll never be a low river. It's always going to be running from, from, from bank to bank, brim full. Water in the Bible is a reflection, a symbol of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit cleanses us. The Holy Spirit washes us white as snow. The Holy Spirit refreshes and renews us. And there is this river of renewal and refreshment running right through the heart of the city, right down Main Street. And this river feeds two trees. Remember what the name of the tree is? Tree of Life. You ever heard about that tree before? It doesn't show up first in Revelation. Where does it show up first? Genesis. It's the tree that God told Adam and Eve, eat all you want of this tree. It's always yours until they sinned. And then he cut them off from the tree. He didn't cut the tree down. He simply transplanted it for a while. But he's going to give it back to us. But he's not only going to give us one tree, he's going to double our pleasure and give us two, one on each bank. So you don't have to worry about crossing a bridge. If you're on one side of the river, no problem. If you're on the other, no problem. He's got trees there, and they're going to produce fruit every single month. And it tells us, because we eat of the tree of life, we will have ongoing health. No more sickness in heaven. Actually, that word um, translated ongoing health is the word that we translate in English to therapy. Sorry, Rich, no more therapists in heaven just like there'll be no more preachers. Here's the big one. Chapter 22, verse 3. No longer will there be any curse. The curse in the Garden of Eden has finally been lifted. It will all be made right. The world and its people, we're now put back on track, and God is with us, just like in the original garden. The curse is reversed. God says, I will make all things new. Think about the parallels between Genesis and Revelation. This is Genesis. This is Revelation. All right? God creates the world. 
God creates a new heaven and a new earth. Devil introduces sin into the world. The devil is destroyed and sin is done away with. Humanity falls into sin. In Revelation, God restores humanity to a sinless state. The world is cursed in Genesis. The curse is removed in Revelation. People are separated from God in Genesis. People live with God forever in Revelation. People shed tears and now know sorrow for the first time in Genesis. God wipes away our last tear and removes every bit of sorrow in Revelation. People are barred from the tree of life. People eat freely now from two trees of life. Death enters the world in Genesis. Death is done away with in Revelation. God's master plan goes from cover to cover in the scriptures. God is in charge, and God is going to work all things out. Trust your life to him. Ensure your name is in the Lamb's book of life, and you have heaven for your eternal dwelling place. Robert Lowry pastored a church in New York City in 1864. There was a terrible epidemic that broke out across town. Lowry visited many homes And he saw many loved ones dying. Many of their family members would cry out for help in the midst of sickness and death. He wrote that he often turned to this passage in Revelation and read it to them for encouragement. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God down the great city, the street of the great city. On each side was the tree of life, no more curse, we will see his face. As Robert Lowry thought about that passage and that great reunion that would be ours someday, he wrote a poem. That poem in the 20th century became a very famous hymn in the church. It's a hymn I grew up with. It's a hymn that I couldn't find in our hymnal that we don't use very often. But I couldn't find it in there. It's that old. It's a song I liked, but it's a song I always thought had a slight misunderstanding. And what I found out this week is I was the one who misunderstood. I had for some reason thought that this particular song was talking about the River of Jordan. Because sometimes in in songs we give symbols or images that aren't completely biblically accurate. And, and sometimes people would talk about crossing over Jordan as if we were crossing into heaven, the promised land. But we have to remember the promised land Israel went to had enemies and fenced cities, and they were disobedient and rebellious. And so the promised land is not a picture of heaven. And so I often didn't give this song near as much credit as I will from this day forward. Because now I understand the origin of this song was not the River Jordan. The origin of this song is the throne of God, described in Revelation 21 and 22. The name of the song, Shall We Gather at the River. How many of you know this song? Raise your hand. A few more of you. Buddy Green is going to lead us in this song on the screen. And um, Buddy Green, he sings it pretty straight, except he does the first verse first, and then he does the fourth verse, and then he does the second verse. Okay? And, And actually, it makes sense just a little bit. But as you know the words, certainly feel free to sing along. And as you know the chorus, yes, we'll gather at the river, the beautiful, the beautiful river. Gather with the saints at the river that flows from the throne of God. You would have think I would have been smart enough to have figured out where this song came from when I was singing it all those years. And most frequently, you know when we would sing this song? At baptismal services, when we were down by the river, all right, before we had baptistries in our church. But I was so moved when I found out this song was written from that passage of Scripture. Let's follow along with Buddy Green. There's a place in there where they do an instrumental solo, so don't bust out real loud or you'll be slightly embarrassed, okay? For those of you who are under 30 and maybe even 40, you're going to think I'm really peculiar in what I'm about to say. But as you get a little maturity on you, this will make sense to you. The reason I know this is because I used to think when my dad would say this, he was a little peculiar. But the more we understand truths that these hymns are based on, 
the less fear we have of death and dying and the more excitement we have of what's the, on the other side of the valley of death. Amen. Almost to the point that it wouldn't bother me if there was a bus right outside that door that said heaven on it and I wouldn't have a lot of trouble stepping foot on that bus right now. I've had a chance to think about so many that I've already said goodbye to that I can't wait to hear them say hello. And the fears, the fears of the process are falling away. If you don't know Jesus, why don't you take this closing moment to invite him in your life. If you do know him, why don't you thank him for the kind of hope that heaven offers to us? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're often like little children who forget where we are and where we belong. And you are so patient with us. You tell us again and again and again of a place that you have prepared for us where you will always be our source of light and you will always meet our every need. It's not a boring place. It's a place beyond our most wild imaginations. Encourage us, Father, on a regular basis to remember that every day we live here is another day of our journey to home, to the Father's house. You have an ultimate plan and purpose for us that you were working out, whether we are young, middle-aged, or old. You have a plan and a purpose for us. Father, I pray we will be encouraged by our great hope of heaven that we will want to share your love and your hope with others around us. We want to fill the bus that takes us to heaven. Thank you for this sweet time today with you, dear Jesus. In your Son's name, the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day today. Enjoy this holiday weekend. See you next Sunday.